tonight. I'm going to do a, on intellectual freedom as well and um, covering some of the same things um, that Cindy just did, but hopefully some new things as well. Um, I'm going to be presenting um, with an audience of fellow librarians in mind and probably more in the middle school range um, just based on some of the books that we're going to talk about. So we'll go ahead and get started. So intellectual freedom um, is the American Library Association says just that it's the right of every individual to both seek and receive information from all points of view without restriction. It provides for free access to all expressions of ideas through which any and all sides of a question, cause, or movement may be explored. And I want to talk about that definition for just a minute. And I want us to really look at some of those words that are important. So in a moment, I'll have you go to the um, Padlet um, using the QR code or the link. I didn't make it as big. I should have made it larger. Hopefully, you can see it. Um, but I want you to kind of think about those two questions right there, um, which words in that definition do you feel are the most important ones um, and why? And then how does intellectual um, freedom impact students and librarians? So I'll give you a moment or so to go ahead and head over to the Padlet and start entering your answers. And I'll join in just a minute once everyone's had a chance to get the link. Okay, I'll head on over and I'll give you just a few moments to, um, to answer those questions. Okay, so I'll go ahead and kind of talk about the ones. I see some of you have um, all kind of focused on some of the same words, um, but it's a right that we have, that, that we and students, all of us have been given that right, um, that it's free access. There shouldn't be um, any charge or anything for any of the information that we um, are trying to, to seek out. Um, I like, though, that we brought up both they can seek information on their own or receive information um, from various sources, whether that's, um, you know, a book they read, whether it's um, a website. Um, and the main thing I think is important, too, is someone else brought it up, that it's all sides, um, that they can see um, a particular issue um, from many points of view. Um, it may be that they um, are learning about um, someone, maybe it's someone in their class that's from a different, um, you know, background or religion or ethnic group. And I think it's important that they get to see the other side of things, that the books that they um, have access to um, allow them to see what it's like to be in someone else's shoes. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, I like moving on to the next question about how it impacts students and librarians. Um, someone wrote that it's central to the purpose of the library, and I totally agree with that. Um, we are expected to uphold you know, um, intellectual freedom and allow these students to come into a place where they can look for information um, and search for the things that they're trying to find, whether it be information you know, just simple information on an animal or if they're seeking information on, you know, uh, something going on at home or um, something else that they're dealing with that maybe they don't want to um, talk to anyone else about. It gives them the freedom and a safe place to come. All right, I will move on back to my PowerPoint. 
All right, so as uh, librarians, we are responsible for intellectual freedom. And according to the ALA Code of Ethics, we should uphold the principles of intellectual freedom and fight against all efforts to censor resources and materials in the library. And this can include, but this just is, this is not a comprehensive list, but this includes allowing students to choose they book, the books they want to read without restriction, um, without, you know, labeling a certain section or having parental permission or things like that, or just telling them that it's not appropriate for them. Um, it means that we are following our district policy when a parent or a teacher or an administrator challenges a book or resource in the library, um, making sure that we have chosen books and selected books that fall within our selection policy. And then that way we can follow that policy as well and let parents know or a teacher know that um, the book that you've chosen does fall within those guidelines and to follow that challenge policy as well. Um, it helps to cover everyone and um, uphold that intellectual freedom for the students. We also need to make sure that selecting book, when we're selecting books to purchase, that we're adding diversity to our collections and um, keep, we're keeping our own personal beliefs out of, the, out of the decision. And I think that can be um, tricky for some people. I mean, even my, my mentor, um, I've heard her talk about different things that I think could be um, a, um, a kind of self-censorship sort of, sort of thing without her realizing that that's what's happening. Um, I think that um, whether we think a book is just not good quality literature, just like we were talking um, earlier about certain authors, um, or if we are um, choosing books that don't go along with our personal belief system, choosing not to purchase those. I think we have to be very careful with those. Um, then we move into censorship. And censorship can happen on many different levels. Uh, when a parent or another party imposes their values or beliefs on a student by denying them access to a particular book or resource, um, parents can challenge books in, in which they try to get a book or a resource removed from the library so that others are not able to access the content within that book, and that's a form of censorship. Then self-censorship happens when a librarian chooses not to purchase a book because of their own personal values and it goes against the principles of intellectual freedom um, that we're required to uphold. Um, and this little video we're gonna watch is just um, a little scenario. Um, there's a lot of dialogue or a lot of boxes on it. Focus on the dialogue of the two little cartoon characters. That's the part that is uh, most important. Let me actually go to...
Okay, in looking at um, that video, I thought it was really important. A couple of things stood out to me, um, and one of them was the fact that um, just a simple comment from the um, librarian aide or paraprofessional in there um, to the to the little boy was really, um, you know, a censorship comment and uh, how easy it is to say things like that if we're not careful and to to impose our own views on um, on the students, especially when we do take their interests in mind and we are, you know, fighting for them and working for them every day, um, and we have their best, in, you know, interests at heart. So we have to be very careful with that. The other thing that I took away from that video that I thought was really important was how important it is to educate um, our, you know, school community and the teachers that are with us along with the parents and you know how that's important and how they can educate their students on um, what they feel is important and what they're okay with them reading at home or at school and um, really talk to them about talk to their children about that I thought that was really important okay any questions Okay, so when we look at um, the next slide, which is district policies, we just know that we have, um, oh, hang on. Okay, so we have district policy in place, and when we create our district policies for a library, whether it's um, already been created for us or one that um, we're having to create ourselves, it's important that we look through those to make sure that a couple of things are included. Um, it's important that we include a statement that refers to the U.S. Constitution's First Amend Amendment or the Bill of Rights, the Library Bill of Rights, um, those different things that show um, that the students have a right um, to access information. They have a right to read and to listen and to choose the books that they want. And these rights are protected under those um, government issues. Um, it's important that we say in our policies that um, we're going to uphold that, and it's our job to do that. It's also important that our selection policies, um, if we have procedures about how to handle book challenges, um, that we focus on the steps that are focused on intellectual freedom rather than just the content of the book. It shouldn't be about the particular phrase or word or content that the parents or the censor is um, challenging, but instead um, is our students' rights to intellectual freedom being upheld, and that's what we really should be fighting for. <clears throat> All right, so um, when we think about challenge books, um, there's a difference between challenge books and banned books. Challenge books are books that um, just someone has tried to get removed in a library due to their opinions about the content, and that could be um, they may not have been successful. It may be one that they just talked to a librarian or a principal about. Um, it may be something that they um, actually took through the process and filled out the forms and had a committee look at the, the books. Um, but challenge books are ones that they've just tried to get done. And I found this um, infographic from the ALA that I thought was really interesting um, that had all this information statistics about the censorship for the for 2017 um, and the main thing I thought was interesting was um, where um, now this has to do with ban or challenged books in both a school and public library so it doesn't just focus on school libraries but I did think it was interesting um, the different number of people who were involved to see that board administration was 14%, I thought was pretty surprising. Um, I'm not surprised that parents play a large part. Um, I would assume that, um, I don't know if it's good to assume, but I would assume that the patrons um, would be, well, they could be students too, um, but I was surprised to see that such a large number. Um, and then it tells you some of the many reasons why books are challenged. Um, and I found it really interesting over the years, as you look at the different infographics, you'll see that the LGBT content 
is becoming more and more um, popular as our world changes and um, different viewpoints, you know, come into play that we see more of those um, contexts in the book and more and more people are beginning to fight back against those things. But I think it's really important that students have a place, um, a safe place to go and choose books that, you know, have that content in there if that's something that they're dealing with. Um, and it shows you where the different types of things take place. So 56% in public libraries and then 25% in school settings um, and then the others. And then it talks about various other things that are not that are also banned besides books. But I just thought this was really interesting infographic that they had it all in one place for you to see the different statistics um, that that were here. Let's see here. Okay, and then um, they have a video for the 10 most challenged books of 2017, which I thought was pretty interesting. Only to find a gap on the shelf where it's supposed to be. Imagine having a challenging discussion about a book in your English class, then being told to stop because your school's administration decided that you shouldn't be exposed to an offensive slur. Or imagine stopping at the school library during the study hall to find the librarian packing the book she's been directed to ban because they can use curse words. This is censorship, and it happens more often than you think. Thousands of books have been threatened with removal in libraries and schools across the country, all in an effort to silence one of the most important challenging provocative voices in literature. But don't get discouraged. We can fight back against censorship. Across the country, students, librarians, and engaged citizens have been organizing to protect our right to read. That can mean circulating petitions on social media, piling into board meetings and demanding change, hosting discussions, or even just speaking out and reporting censorship when you see it happening. Banning books silences stories and discussions. Often the most frequently challenged books are the stories that need to be heard the most. Of the 416 books that were challenged or banned in 2017, here are the top 10 most challenged. Number 10, I Am Jazz, written by Jessica Herzl and Jazz Jennings, and illustrated by Sheila McNichols, because it addresses the topic of gender identity. Number 9, And Tango Mix 3, written by Peter Parnell and Justin Richardson, and illustrated by Henry Cole, because it features a same-sex relationship. Number 8, The Hate You by Angie Thomas, because it includes drug use, profanity, and offensive language. Number seven, To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee, because of violence and its inclusion of racial slurs. Number six, Sex is a Funny Word, written by Corey Silverberg, illustrated by Fiona Smith, because its opponents believe that children should not be exposed to sex education. Number five, George, by Alex Gino, because it includes a transgender child. Number four, The Kite Runner by Kala Hosseini, because it includes depictions of sexual violence and deals with religious themes. Number three, Drama, written and illustrated by Raymond Talbot, because it includes LGBT characters. Number two, The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Sherman Olympia, because of profanity and situations that were deemed sexually explicit. And the number one banned book in 2017 was 13 Reasons Why by Jay Asher because it discusses suicide. Now more than ever, readers need to come together and not be afraid of ideas that challenge us. We need to advocate for libraries that open doors to a bigger array of diverse viewpoints, even ones that might make us uncomfortable. Your words can combat the silencing of stories and attacks on your freedom to read. Raise your megaphone and speak out for banned books. To learn more, visit ala.org forward slash books. What I really liked about that video, um, not only did it show various reasons why it would be that way, but I love the, what it talked about with um, the, um, how it said some of the most banned books have stories that, you know, really need to be told. And I think that's really true that um, our kids deal with so much these days that we don't realize. And um, it's important for them to have a place, again, to find those 
uh, find books and things to read about those situations. Um, now, banned book is actually one that has been removed from the library due to the content. So um, for numerous reasons um, that we've talked about already that we've seen, um, and I wanted to do a little quiz. So if you could go to Kahoot.com um, on your device, and then I will give you, you know, click play, and I'll give you the quiz to the quiz number, game number um, to go into. Let's see. All right, so wait for that pin number to pop up. Okay, so if you go in, you'll put in this game pin number right here for us to play a little, a little game. Once you click, well, I can't go from my screen, but once you go to Kahoot.com, it should have gone in, there should be a play button right next to where it says log in or sign up. I see a new K. Oh, then you're logged in on your own Kahoot. Yes. And you can also type in Kahoot.it, and it'll oh, take okay. you straight to the game screen. Thank you. Kahoot.it. Oh, got it. Thank you. Yeah. All right. We'll let her get logged in and we'll get started. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and start. Is everybody ready? All right. We just have five questions, but I thought this is a fun little way to test your knowledge about banned books. Great Gatsby was a band book and turned into a 2013 film starring Leonardo DiCaprio. All right, our next question. Oh, there we go. Our leaderboard. These band books were turned into a 2014 movies, both starring Shailene Woodley and Ansel Elgort. So there's two answers for this one. Very good. So we had Fault in Our Stars and Divergent. All right. This band book was made into a 2012 film starring Emma Watson, Logan Lerman, and Ursa Miller. Parts of being a wallflower. All right, next, this band book was turned into a 2008 film starring Kristen Stewart and Robert Pattinson. <laughs> Very good. Twilight. All right, our last question. Sally's in the lead. All right, we've got this band book, sorry, just one, was turned into a 2003 film starring Hank, Tom Hanks and Ian McKellen. All 
it was the, the Da Vinci Code. All right. Thank you all for playing. Very, very good. Okay, let me head back to my PowerPoint. All right, so a way that you can celebrate uh, band, with band books is Band Books Week, which is September 23rd through 29th. 29th, I'm sorry. And there is lots of great ideas at the Band Books Week um, org website. And there's ideas. I'll, I'll kind of click on it and show you. There's lots of great ideas. There's resources um, like flyers and, you know, um, graphics and um, various things that you can do. Um, they've got ideas. Let's see if I go down. Different posters and things you can do. Where to celebrate. Um, and then there's also different promotional tools or resources that you can use, different activities and ideas that you can use within your school. So there's, oops, gosh, there's lots of great ideas, even student ideas to get them involved, um, which would be a wonderful, wonderful thing to do. Um, let's see, I believe that is all. There are my resources, and then I will pull up really fast and show you my handout. Um, just so you kind of see what it looks like. It was a just kind of a review of what we've talked about, kind of summarizes some of the key points and some of the main things that we need to watch out for um, as librarians. And that is all, and I'm done. Okay, thank you, Christina. Thank you.